Okay, so welcome back. Now that we have looked at the stress and strain field for edge dislocation as well as the screw dislocation, we are now in a position to determine the energy of the dislocations. So what we will use is the standard rule, a standard equation for finding the energy if we know the stress and strain, which is one by two d sigma into d epsilon, which gives us energy per unit volume. So what we have here is So the sigma and epsilon both have several components. So first we will need to summate them where i is equal to x to y to z, sigma ij times epsilon ij and overall volume. But this is per unit length. The dislocation is uh, whatever energy we calculate, it is for the energy per unit length. So if you look at a dislocation, it is like this, and it has some core region where there is lot, very, very large distribution or dif uh, difference in the misfit between the atoms. So in that region, we will not have uh, elastic energy. And therefore, when we are using this equation, we will not be able to calculate the energy for that region, which would be contributing to the core. So this will be the E core. And outside it, we have the elastic deformation. And here we will have the E elastic. So this, this relation that we will be deriving or using to get to the final energy would be only for this part. And this one we will have to estimate from other ways. And therefore, the total energy of the dislocation would be E elastic plus E core. Okay, so coming back to this equation, so as this is more like a cylinder, and therefore, when we look at it, dV by L, so volume of a cylinder, so it will be 2 pi r dr. So volume is equal to pi r square into L, but we already have divided by L because this is the per unit length, whatever energy we calculate. Therefore, it is pi r square and therefore dv by L becomes 2 pi r dr. So we have over here. And uh, the next thing is that we will first be calculating for a screw dislocation where we have the cylindrical coordinates where the formation formulation or the equation is much more sim simpler or easier to deal with. So we will have sigma theta z epsilon theta z plus sigma z theta to epsilon z theta. So here we said sigma ij into epsilon ij, meaning the same sigma should multiply with the same epsilon, which is what we are doing over here, only that we are doing it for cylindrical coordinate. And for the screw dislocation, we saw those relations were very straightforward and dv by l becomes 2 pi r dr. And these two are same. So basically whatever we write for this will be into two. And therefore this becomes this two gets cancelled and what we have is pi r dr and this one is gb by two pi r into b by four pi r into two because we have two times and therefore this becomes gb square by four pi dr by r and this is the small amount of energy in a thin cylinder at a distance r in the thickness of dr. So this is where what we get in this thin cylinder at a distance r.
Now to get full energy all the way up to the diameter that we want, we will have to integrate it from a smallest star to the largest star. And therefore, E elastic is equal to GV square by 4 pi dr by r, where r goes from smallest value to some larger value r. So the smallest value we are calling r naught and the largest value we are calling r. And at this point, again, I will like to remind you that this energy that we have calculated is in elastic energy per unit length. Now, coming back to the right hand side, so we have the smallest R naught and the largest R naught. So, largest R. So, what is the value of the smallest R naught? Now, looking at this equation, clearly the diameter of the radius of the core is what will be the smallest R. So, this is core radius. And usually it is taken somewhere from B to 4b. But what about the higher side, upper side? What should be the maximum value of r? Now, ideally, we would like to go all the way to infinity, but then no material extends to infinity. So, should it go up to the dimensions of the component? The answer is no. The actual value up to which r would extend is the size of the grain. So assuming that this dislocation is somewhere at the center, so the radius, this R would go all the way up to the half of the diameter. So this will be determined by grain size. And if the diameter of the grain size is D, then R would be D by two. And therefore what we obtain is for screw dislocation, where we know what are the values of R and R naught. And if it were edge, then there is one slight change from this. And it is that there is a factor of one minus nu. So this is the elastic energy for the dislocation. This is the edge dislocation and this is the screw dislocation. Now here uh, we have already mentioned that this is the elastic component. Now if we want the total energy component, then we can write it like this. E elastic plus E core, where we already know the E elastic. And let's say we are talking about screw, then it is GB square by four pi ln R by R naught, because this is what is varying for G and B would be constant. And this is something that would vary from dislocation to dislocation. And let's say for the core component, we write the term B. Now this whole thing can now be approximated as some parameter and usually you can write it like alpha gb square. So this is a very common relation that is used to describe the energy of dislocations. And here alpha is anywhere in the range of 0 0.5 to 1.5. So a couple of things uh, are important to note here that the unit of this energy is joule per meter because it is energy per unit length. Another thing that we have already emphasized is that core 
energy cannot be modeled using linear elastic equations we have already seen that the core radius is usually taken from b to 4b it depends upon the model on the researcher depending on other parameters they may find the radius core radius somewhere between b to 4b another important uh, fact is that the energy of the core is about one tenth the total of the dislocation so if you look back into this equation so what it is saying is this b is approximately 10 percent and this factor is 90 percent so that will comprise, compro, comprise the total energy of the dislocation. And uh, overall, we will have the energy as alpha GB square. So the elastic energy is usually taken as 1 by 2 GB square, where G is the shear modulus and B is the Berger's vector. Now, since we are talking about uh, energy, so this also means that dislocations will tend to have the lowest energy and when can they have the lowest energy, they cannot change G. R and R0 are not within a dislocations purview. What it can change is though the Verger's vector. So a dislocation would tend to have smallest Verger's vector. So if you have possibility of several Verger's vector, the dislocations would only be possible where the Burgess vector is smallest because it is we are talking about in terms of energy as it costs energy to put a dislocation in a crystal. dislocations tend to have as a small b as possible. Another important thing is that because we are talking about this dislocation as a line and because it has energy associated with it, Therefore, there will also be a line tension associated with the dislocation. And in order to minimize the energy, sometimes the dislocation may dissociate into what are called as partials. And the sum of those partials would be less than the energy of the uh, original dislocations. So you may have a dislocation 
like this and at some point it may dissociate into these two Berger vectors. So these two dislocations. So let's say if this was the Berger's vector B1, this was B2 and this was B3. So this is favorable. That is this transformation into, this, uh, into the partials is favorable only if B1 square is less, is greater than B2 square plus B3 square. Because energy is proportional to Berger's vector square, therefore we will take the squares of the Berger's vector and compare. So if ever you have to find out whether this uh, dislocation reaction would be favorable or whether this dislocation would dissociate, you have to just calculate the square and then compare the total energy, uh, compare the values. And then you would know which if it is lower, then it means it would be favorable. If not, then it would be unfavorable. So that is how we compare. And in this respect, let's say we are given Berger's vector for two dislocations. So let's say this is one dislocation, which has some Berger's vector, which is B1 equal to A by 2, 1, 1, 0. And there is another dislocation, which has Berger's vector B2. And this is a purely fictional case because usually you don't have this kind of dislocations. So B1 and B2 are there and it is given that these dislocations combine to form one dislocation, which has B3 Berger's vector. So first thing is to find out what is that B3 Berger's vector. So B3 Berger's vector would be equal to B1 plus B2. So if we add these two, what we get is A by 2. So you can take it as A by 2, 0, 2 bar, 2 bar. So now we add A by 2, 1 plus 0 is 1. 0 and 2 bar is 1 bar. And this is 0 and 2 bar. So this is 2 bar. Now, how do we calculate the energy? So on this side, you have B1, B2, and on this side, you have B3. So we will take the squares of these. So the square of B1, so B1 is, is A by 2, 1, 1, 0, which means it will become A square by 4, 1 square plus 1 square is equal to A square by 2. BT is similar, A square, 1 square plus 1 square. So this is 2A square. And over here we have A square by 4, 1 square plus 1 square plus 2 square. So this is 6 by 4A square equal to 3 by 2A square. On the other hand, if we sum these two, what we get is 5 by 2 a square. Therefore, this energy is greater than this. And therefore, what we understand is what we now know is that this after reaction, it will have lower energy. And therefore, this reaction is energetically favorable. Now the next question is that we have already seen the energy of edge dislocation. We have seen the energy of screw dislocation. How do we calculate the energy of a mixed dislocation? So let's say you have 
a dislocation line going like this, where so that we are looking at a segment which is straight, and therefore the line vector is like this, but the verger vector is given like this. So that this angle is theta, which means that the Berger vector component parallel to you is is equal to B cos theta. And the Berger's vector perpendicular to U is equal to B sine theta. So effectively now what we have is that we can consider it that there is a edge dislocation and a screw dislocation superimposed onto each other. And we know the Berger's vector for both of them. So what we all we need to do to calculate the elastic energy is to use the equation that we have for screw dislocation and edge dislocation. So for the edge dislocation, where we have sine theta as the Berger's vector, so we take GB square sine square theta by four pi one minus nu. And for the screw dislocation, we have GB square cos square theta by four pi. And therefore we can take some of these quantities outside. And we have a simpler relation, sine square theta by one minus nu plus cos square theta. So this gives us the relation for the energy of mixed dislocation. And we have also seen how to compare the energy of uh, the dislocations to find out whether a reaction would be favorable or not. And uh, another important thing that we have mentioned and we will utilize later is, to, is that there is always a line tension associated with the dislocation. And uh, these are the energy of the dislocation, the elastic component and the core component. So that brings us to the end of this lecture. And we will, in the next topic, we'll explore more about dislocation motion. Uh, we talked about energy of dislocations. Now related to this is a very important concept about dislocation, which is the line tension. So if you want to increase the length of dislocation, it would basically mean you will have to increase the energy of the dislocations and which as any system would like to minimize. And therefore there will be a force tension which will try to um, disallow it from increasing. And therefore if you want to, or any internal or external stresses wants to cause a curvature in the dislocation, it would mean that it will have to overcome that line tension. So in this particular, uh, topic, we will look at the relation between the shear stress required to create a radius of particular curvature against the line tension in the dislocation. So let's begin. So let's say that this is a dislocation which has been curved because of some shear stress. So now I will show the shear stress like this, shear stress is acting like this tau, and there is also line tension, okay? So the line tension is probably, will have to be act, uh, will be acting along the line direction at that particular point. So this is assuming a very small region and So we will assume that this is a very small segment, which is d theta. And which would mean that this would also be d theta by two. 
and this line tension is T and this line tension is also T. So a component of this line tension T is acting in this direction, which is trying to reduce the length or get rid of this curvature and a shear stress is acting, which will try to create this curvature, which has a radius R. So now let's look at what is the line tension, which is force is basically related to energy and it can be directly given as alpha GB square. So why it is alpha GB square? Because alpha GB square was actually the energy per unit length, which is nothing but force. So it is also acting as a force, this energy per unit length. Now, if we take the component, which is acting in this direction, so we have T cos d theta by two, sorry, sine, it would be sine d theta by two, because this is T, this is d theta by two. So the component in this direction is T sine d theta by two. Similarly over here, T sine d theta by two. So there are two of these, Therefore, it means that the total force acting in this direction, trying to get rid of this curvature is 2t sine d theta by 2. On the other hand, the stress, shear stress that you need to apply is tau, which uh, will have to be translated to force, where this is the force. So tau into b into, let's say this length, overall length is dl so tau b into dl and you can clearly see this is force per unit length and into dl which makes it total force so this is left hand side is force right hand side is force so dimensionally we are correct and now when we relate it what we see is that tau is equal to t by b and we will take theta so small that sine d theta by 2 becomes d theta by 2 therefore this becomes t by b so this when you make it uh, sine d theta by 2 equal to d theta by 2 the 2 2 gets cancelled and what we have t into d theta so tau is equal to t by b into dl by d theta but dl by d theta is nothing but curvature which is equal to 1 over r and therefore this relation translates to t by b r and t we know is nothing but the alpha gb square therefore this becomes alpha gb square by b r which is equal to alpha gb by r therefore you need a shear stress equal to alpha gb by r which this can be internal or external internal or external shear stress required to make a radius r in this location. So this is the effect, side effect of the energy that is associated with this location, which leads to the line tension and which leads to the fact that you must apply at least this much tau to create this right kind of radius. So if you have very small radius, you can see that you need a very large shear stress because very large, small radius means you're creating a very small, uh, or you need to create a uh, like a small loop. Therefore, you need a very large shear stress. On the other hand, a very small radius, which means that the curvature is very, very, uh, or the center of radius is very far. In that case, you need a very small shear stress. So this uh, is uh, clearly in sync with what we know about dislocations and gives a relation between the shear stress and the radius of curvature. So we will end this topic here. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.